good morning. Um, well, I was reading my Bible this morning pretty early, and uh, I was reading about uh, Joseph, you know, when he goes and goes to Egypt, and he's in slavery, and, you know, nothing seems like it went as planned for him, at least. And, uh, but, you know, through, through all that planning or non-planning, however you want to say it, you know, God, God, uh, moved mightily for the Israel nation. And, you know, uh, they had for the seven years of famine, uh, it saved his whole, uh, household and his father and brothers and, and everything. So just because things are not going as planned, doesn't mean that they're off course. I think that's kind of going like this morning with setting up this sound. <laughs> it's just, but anyways, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning. God, once again, gathered together in your name, Father, it's, it's wonderful. Lord, I love that it's a little bit chilly. God, uh, we just thank you for everything, Lord. We continue to pray safety over our firefighters and everybody out there, God, that uh, uh, people that's uh, lost homes and, and Father, even up in Oregon and just everything that's going on, Lord, it's, it's devastating. God, but uh, we believe that um, you can turn all things around. Father, that you can restore what was lost. Father, there's nothing impossible for you. So, Lord, uh, we will leave all of our worries and all of our, our stresses aside this morning, and we will just go after the one that can change all things. God, so we just thank you and praise you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
go through these tough weeks, all these things that are happening, God, and we need to be refueled and re-strengthened. And God, and so we come to church and we and we look to be filled up. And, and God, it's, Lord, I, I love that this song, that the team, they chose this song last because if we would just get our eyes on you, Lord, and just worship, God, that we would get the strength. We would receive that, that feeling that we need that re-strengthening. God, it's not about just hearing a, a good message. That's part of it. Fellowshipping together, that's part of it. But the greatest source, Lord, of refilling and a re-strengthening and encouragement is to just be able to get our eyes off of the things around us, our thoughts, our opinions, the things that we hope to see, and just to get them on you and say, Lord, I'm, I'm just here to worship. I'm just here to, to praise you. I'm just here to help me get the things reprioritized in my life, the things that consumed my time this week. God, I would prefer just to be worshiping you and let that consume me consume my time and so father i thank you god that you are already service is just starting and you're already strengthening and encouraging refreshing the people here this morning lord and i praise you for it in jesus name amen <clears throat> You know, Quinn and I and a few others, we uh, went to, this last week, went to Yellowstone National Park, and uh, it, we just had an incredible time. And I want to, you know, I got back, I watched the, uh, the video of the service last week. I thought it was just a f fabulous service. And uh, so I want to... Thank Leyland and Manda and the team and everyone that uh, came. I know there was uh, a lot of, uh, it was just good word. In fact, last week, uh, as I was watching it online, I was thinking, wow, there was so many, uh, you know, of course, any time that we're sharing a message, and I know for Leyland too, you, you, and, and for me, we have this, uh, this goal that we want to see accomplished from start to finish with the message, you know, hopefully this is the idea that gets, that, that's shared and people receive this. But last week as I was watching the video, I was like, like throughout the whole thing, there was just like these little one-liners that it was like, oh man, that's a whole message. <laughs> that's a whole, me you, if you want to dig into it and watch the video, I'd encourage you, if you haven't seen it, watch it again because it's full of little nuggets that I uh, literally, if you dove into, I mean, I was even thinking about it, man, I could just take Leyland's message last week and, and get like four or five weeks out of, <laughs> but uh, so anyways, I'd encourage you, check it out if you haven't seen it, if you weren't here last week, uh, go back and watch the video. And, and even the week before that, Quinn shared, and the week before that, um, God had me share on the Holy Spirit, and it's like, it's kind of a buildup. It's like every week is, you know, building upon the week before. And so I'm going to take it uh, a little bit further today. I want to talk to you guys about uh, the kingdom of God, and, and I'm going to, before we get into the kingdom of God specifically and how, how it impacts you and how you fit into this whole thing, uh, we're going to talk about kingdom in general, because in the New Testament, uh, there, there are specifically, there's four different kingdoms that are talked about in the New Testament. And so we're going to look at those four and, and then kind of see where we fit into this thing. And so I'm going to reference a lot of scripture today um, as I'm just speaking. And I, and I hope that 
uh, for those of you that have been in the Word some, that as I'm talking, you're going to be pulling, God's going to be just showing you, okay, this is the verse, this is the verse. I'm not going to give addresses to all these verses, um, but as I speak, I want you guys to be thinking about, you know, and, and allow the Holy Spirit to bring up those verses to your remembrance, in your memory, um, because th the, the heart of the message today is one verse. Usually I would do a whole passage or something. It's one verse. We're going to dig into one verse today. It's in Luke chapter 16. If you have your Bibles or you're doing it on your phone or tablet, you can go to Luke uh, chapter 16, and we will get there near the end. So you've got a while to find Luke 16. <laughs> I want to talk about, I want to, so we're going to dig into this whole kingdom thing, and you'll see it come together at the end, so stick with me for a bit. Uh, there are four types of the kingdom that the New Testament talks about, and, all, and a lot of these passages I'm going to just pull out of just a couple chapters. Uh, Jesus talks about kingdom a lot. A lot of times he tells us, go and preach the kingdom of God. You have to have an understanding what the kingdom of God is. You can never preach the kingdom of God if you don't have an understanding of what it is. That's what we're going to dig into today. So there's four, there's four kingdoms specifically that Jesus talks about. This is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdoms of the world, and the kingdom of Satan. Those are the four that's listed in the New Testament. Uh, and we're going to look at each one of these a little bit because when you take these four you quickly find that you can just put two in one column and two in the other column. And so we, this is going to be helpful to us. When you can make the distinction, and these go here and these go here. And so the first, the first one I listed, the kingdom of God. Uh, and I'm going to look at this just from the book of Luke out of just a couple chapters, a few verses here. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a description of it. Um, Chapter 9, verse 2, it says, He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Another place, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. Another place, and he healed the sick there, and he said to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. And then he says in another place, But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Another place, and don't seek... Uh, and do not seek what you should eat or drink, nor have an anxious mind for all these things the nations of the world seek after, but your Father knows that you need them. Seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. So we see just right there in a, in a quick few verses, we see the kingdom of God. Uh, there's a few things that are incorporated into the kingdom of God. Healing is incorporated into the kingdom of God. Deliverance is incorporated into the kingdom of God. Provision is incorporated into the kingdom of God. Just real quick. You guys have already getting, getting a, hopefully getting a picture of what the kingdom of God represents. Let's look at the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven appears 32 times in Scripture in New Testament. Now, all 32 of those are in the book of Matthew and nowhere else in the New Testament. And here's why. There's a, well, I would say, uh, Bible scholars have a, have a couple, I think it really boils down to maybe two different explanations for this. Uh, the first is that one is referencing a place, the kingdom of heaven. It would be like if I said, well, the streets are gold in the kingdom of heaven. Well, obviously that's talking about there and not here. Uh, but the kingdom of, so the kingdom of heaven, that's one play, well, that's one type of thinking is the kingdom of heaven is a place. The kingdom of God is a perspective sort of thing. I don't really jive with that because Matthew will take the same parables and the same stories that's listed in Mark and Luke and John and when they say kingdom of God every single time, Matthew says the kingdom of heaven. So what, what the general consensus is among scholars is that, uh, that Matthew is likely to have used the term kingdom of heaven due to the fact that uh, historically the Jewish audience imposed restrictions on using 
uh, the name of God very often. They didn't use the name of God of Yahweh very much. Could, and when they did, it was like, you know, like a hellfire and brimstone sort of thing. You don't just, you know, it's not like the culture today where, oh my God, where everybody has to, you know, it's just like it's part of the, it's part of the language. And that's not how it was in the Jewish culture. The Jewish culture uh, really feared honored, revered the name of God. And so every time that uh, if it was kind of a general sort of thing, uh, Matthew would use the term kingdom of heaven until he came to a point where it was a very, uh, a very direct or very intimate, very uh, a place where he couldn't get away from using a general term. He then would put in the kingdom of God. To me, that seems more fitting. That's just my opinion. Uh, so we see that the kingdom of heaven, literally only listed in the book of Matthew, but 32 times in the book, is, is speaking of the same thing. It'd be like, uh, the way I was thinking about it was like this. If somebody said, hey, Lance, do you have a truck I could borrow? I could say, yeah, I have a truck. Or I could say, yeah, I have a GMC. It's the same thing different terminology for maybe a different, you know, slightly a different reason because, you know, I, w I just want to make sure that you knew that I'm not a Ford guy, you know, if I, want <laughs> if I wanted to say GMC, I'm still talking about the same thing if I wanted to do that. So we see we can easily lump kingdom of God and kingdom to heaven into one category. So then there's two other there's two other ones. I'm, I'm going to look at the kingdom of Satan. Kingdom of Satan is only listed in one place. And this is Jesus uh, in, in Luke 11. He says, if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beel Beelzebub. Beelzebub was the Pharisees. When Jesus cast out a demon, they said, oh, he does it by by the ruler of demons, Beelzebub. And he said, how can that be? A divided house won't stand. And if I cast out demons by the power of Satan, then how will Satan's house, his house would be divided and how would it stand? His kingdom would be divided. So that's the only time in scripture we see the kingdom of Satan. Now the kingdom of the world. And this, I think this is where... There's been a lot of misunderstanding because of the world that you live in and our desire to press and seek the Lord in the kingdom of God, we, I think we've been tricked a little bit on this whole kingdoms of the world. I'll get into that a little bit more, but let me just uh, read the verse. You guys are going to recognize this right off the bat. When Jesus is being tempted by the devil, it says in Luke 4, verse 5 and 6, it says, Then the devil, taking him up to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you for their glory uh, and their glory. I'll give you the, all this authority and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. So, if I were to ask you, the kingdoms of the world, which category would you put them in? Kingdom of God or kingdom of Satan? You would say Satan, because this is pretty clear. It's pretty easy. But how many people do you know work effortlessly their entire life to make the world a better place? Because of the injustices, because of the... the poverty, because of this, because of that, that people work their whole lives effortlessly, effortlessly to make the world a better place. And guess what the kingdoms of the world are? Kingdom of Satan. So how fruitful is your efforts going to be if you're trying to do it without the influence of the kingdom of God? Completely, you're... It, you may, you may be able to reach into this one area and make a difference here, but guess what? The, the kingdom of Satan 
uh, it, all the, it's just going to move around and there's going to be injustice. There's going to be poverty. There's going to be, you know, all this stuff happens somewhere else. You can't, you're not going to go in and change the kingdom of darkness as a whole in your own power. See, if politically even, you t- whatever party, doesn't matter. Far this way, far this way, or somewhere right in the middle. How much influence, apart from God, are they going to have in making the world a better place? If the world is classified, if you would put it in the category of kingdom of darkness, kingdom of Satan. To me, it seems like it's... um, I don't want to say a waste of time, but apart from God, it's a waste of time. To move into, to go into the kingdom of Satan and try and make it a better, the kingdom of Satan. Yeah, I'm going to make it better. Well, what exact, what, what's better? <laughs> How does that work? I'm going to make, I'm going to make the devil's neighborhood a little cleaner. I'm going to make it operate with a little, you know, I'm going to make them honor each other a little more in his neighborhood. I'm going to clean up the streets in his neighborhood so it doesn't look so filthy. Uh, really. I'd just like to know how that's going to work. Um, so I think that's been really kind of the root of this uh, where I want to go today. Uh, if we put these into two categories here, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven obviously going into one, kingdom of God and kingdoms of the world, kingdom of Satan in the other category, I think there's a really easy way to start to see how these, how these kingdoms work just by looking at the rulers of those respective kingdoms. And so what I did is I did a little search in the Bible and found some straight out of the verse, straight out of scripture, a description of the rulers of these two kingdoms. This is, I know this sounds simple, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to help us uh, to diagnose things that are happening in our life. And so some biblical uh, def- descriptions of Satan. And this is not exhaustive. This is just a, a few verses that, uh, you know, as I searched out some brief descriptions of Satan. But listen to them. This is what the Bible calls Satan a few times. Not exhaustive. Satan, devil, Lucifer, dragon, the evil one, ruler of demons, enemy, tempter, accuser, liar, father of lies, murderer, adversary, serpent, deceiver, devourer, destroyer, thief, vile, ruler of this world, angel of the pit, and Beelzebub. By the way, I thought this was funny because I had to do the Greek study on Beelzebub just to see what it means. Most people say its translation is Lord of the Flies or Ruler of the Flies. It actually goes a little beyond that. It's the Lord or Ruler of the Poop that the flies gather on. That's funny to me. (laughs) Because I like, I'd be like, it's my nature to call Satan names. But (laughs) no, the Bible says, not to do that, I'm be calling names, right? Michael didn't bring a reviling accusation against the devil, but he just simply said, the Lord rebuke you. That's what the Bible says. So we don't, but it is funny. But with knowing that, so when Jesus cast out a demon that we talked about earlier, and they said he does it by the power of Beelzebub, now you see that, was, that wasn't just a misdiagnosis. It was a mockery. It was a mockery to Jesus. Oh yeah, you're, you're, not just, you, you, you're not doing it by God. You're doing it by the power of the Lord of the poop. That's what they told Jesus. But he didn't respond to them in a hateful sort of way. He says, no, 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 you're wrong. Because if I do it by the finger of God, who do your sons do it with? Their sons couldn't cast out anything. So... It's funny, but it's also, uh, it is a mockery, you know, right in Jesus' face. So this is what we have 
Just some descriptions, enemy, tempter, accuser, liar, murderer, adversaries, deceiver, devourer, destroyer. This is just some Bible descriptions of Satan. Uh, but there's this verse in 1 John 3, it says that for this reason, the Son of Man was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil, the works of Satan. So he's here to, so Jesus came to destroy the works of, the, of Satan, to restore man into the kingdom of God, into relationship with God, and then to baptize and fill him with his spirit and fire. There's three, three parts to Jesus' ministry. You don't want to take one out or take two out and focus on one. There's three significant parts to his ministry. All three of them bear an impact to your life. And so, um, so we're going to look at some uh, biblical descriptions of God uh, this is not, uh, just like with the devil, this is not an exhaustive sort of search that I did because I found out that it's over 950 descriptions uh, about God in the Bible. I pulled out about 10 or 15, not 950. So here are some things. And, and when I read these, in your mind, see the difference between the descriptions of Satan and the descriptions of God. Holy, worthy, just, righteous, glorious, gracious, merciful, strong, deliverer, healer, forgiver, loving, mighty, consuming fire, present, as in ever present, comforter, savior, protector, provider, leader, victor, and on and on another 930-ish descriptions. So now, see, when we do it like this, it's a lot easier to say, okay, this category has this type of representation. Healer, forgiver, deliverer, savior, merciful, gracious, kind, right? There's, this category represents that. This category represents vile, hateful, destroyer, all these other things. So, so when something happens in your life, this should be fairly easy. It should be becoming easy to be able to categorize, okay, what is this? Where is the root of this? And what is the source of this? Which category should I place this in? If if I get hit with something in my life that seems terrible, well, would I, would I naturally go ahead and just categorize it with the merciful, loving, kind, forgiving God? Why would I do that? But we do because, because there's people that they want to sound really spiritual. And I, I want you guys to get this because this is what happens is that a, a verse will be taken out of context and it'll, it'll be something like, well, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, Right? which is Job, in, in the pit of Job's despair, his mind, the only thing he can come up with is, well, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And so we make a doctrine out of it, and we say things like, well, I, you know, I have faith in God's sovereignty, and he must be wanting to teach me a lesson through this. And, you know, God, why are you doing this? I just don't understand. I, this, this is, but you know what? You're there. You're on the throne. And we take the things out of this category and then we just throw them into the God category because we think it makes us sound super spiritual. And it thinks, well, you know, I'm at a, I'm a, a higher spiritual understanding. And really what we're doing is we're just basically saying to God, I blame you for this, right? That's what it is. I blame you for this disease. I blame you for losing this loved one in my life. I blame you for the f losing my job. I blame you for whatever. I blame you. But I'm going to disguise it with this elevated understanding that says, well, God, I don't understand why you're doing this, but maybe you want to teach me a lesson. Maybe you want to this. Maybe you want to... But see, mm, the character of the kingdom is... Helper, comforter, savior, protector, provider, leader, victor. What? There's a disconnect. I think that it would be very helpful to us. I, I'm challenging myself too. Recognize 
Man, am I, would I just by nature say, if, you know, if I have a loved one die, is, would it be my nature to just say, man, that's the most gracious thing I've ever seen? No, it's not. So why would I throw it into this category? Why would it, if somebody, if I get the bad news that someone I, I care about a lot has illness, why would I say, oh God, you know, you have the best plan and you must know what you're doing. <laughs> why would I do that? But we do, we misunderstand things. And so I want to, uh, um, I want you guys to be sharp. <laughs> I want you to be sharp and not to be buffaloed and be fooled by, I say buffalo because we went to Yellowstone, right? <laughs> buffaloed, Gabby was with us and of course, she's standing up through the sunroof in the car as the buffalo are walking by the side. I thought maybe she'd try to pet them. It's a good thing because I would hate a dent in my car. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they were obviously, they, I felt bad because I know this is a rabbit trail, but the buffalo were right in the road in the, in the other lane. We, they were on this side. And so this lane is moving along. This lane is backed up like eight miles. There's people down there that'll never know why the traffic was stopped and they'll never probably see the buffalo. They'll just think, well, it's a crowded day today because uh, buffalo were in the road. But um, so it was good. But why, are, why do we get, well, I want us to be sharp. I want us to be sharp and not be buffaloed when somebody um, puts something in a category that shouldn't be there. And then, and then we jump onto that bandwagon because we respect them or because we love them or because we, we think. And so even if I were to do that, I would want you guys to come up and ask me, whoa, 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 Pastor Lance, I thought God's a good God. He is a good God. He's a, he's a really good God. Let's, let's keep these things. So now that we have this picture of what these kingdoms look like, now, I want, to, I want to move into the verse that I actually wanted to focus on today because uh, this is where it really impacts you is in Luke chapter 16, verse 16. And this is Jesus again. And it says, The law and the prophets were until John. But since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. So up until John the Baptist was the law and the prophets, but obviously we don't live prior to John the Baptist. We live after John the Baptist. So now this, is, this, is, this applies to us. This is impacting us. It says, since that time of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. And these, I think, are two fundamental, very fundamental uh, uh, characteristics to the advance of the kingdom of God. Here it is. This is where you come in. This is it in a, nut in a nutshell, is the kingdom of God is preached and it's pressed into. It's preached and it's pressed into. And so, and you're thinking probably to yourself, well, I'm not a preacher, so I must be in the pressing side of it, but that's not the case. You're actually more in the beginning, uh, as much in the beginning of that as you are in, in the latter part of that, and so you're thinking, well, I don't have a uh, license, a ministry license. I don't have, I'm not ordained. I don't have a platform to speak a bunch. So I, I want to show you what this preaching actually means. It says the kingdom of God is preached and is pressed into. And preached is proclaimed with a spiritual passion, with a conviction, believing what you're saying. I hope that that's one of the things that sets us apart from a lot of people in the world is that, is that I, you know, I can get up here and I can preach a message and you guys listen. But if you were with me like Monday through Friday, you would see that, oh, he's not just talking about it on a Sunday. He actually believes it. He actually lives it. And I know this is the same for you. As people get to know you more and spend time with you more, they actually see, no, no, no. He's not just like saying it when it's convenient. He believes it. That's faith. That's conviction. That's preaching. It's that spiritual passion that, no, I, I, 
I own it. This is mine. I'm not just saying it. That's what preaching is. And so when preaching, uh, to preach the kingdom of God, because Jesus says preach the kingdom of God, here's what I want to say, and I want you guys to, 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 to get a hold of this. It's not preaching the entirety of the oracles of God in this great spiritual place of understanding. It's taking one of those attributes that we talked about, the one that impacted you, and declaring it with passion. So when you come across somebody that's lonely saying, you know what? Guess what? I was in the same place. In fact, when I was walking through this terrible time, I thought I was completely alone. But then I surrendered my life to Jesus and I found out I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Guess what happened? You just preached the kingdom of God. You just did it. You, it's, not, it's not this huge thing where you have to have all this tons of understanding. Now, now, we'll get into the pressing in part in a minute of that verse. But I want you to understand that when you, when you take an attribute of the ruler of this perspective kingdom, and you take that attribute that impacted your life, and you share it with somebody, you just preach the kingdom. You preach the, the aspect of the kingdom that impacted you. That's what we're called to do. That, we're not called to preach the things that we don't know and don't understand and never come in contact with. But we're called to speak the things that have changed us. The things that are real to us. See, maybe, maybe you you know, living a, a life previous to the Lord made a lot of mistakes. And, and when, you, when you came to Christ and you surrendered your life to Jesus, you got an overwhelming revelation that you've been made clean and you're not dirty anymore. And so you tell somebody else that, listen, I know you've made a lot of mistakes, but don't ever think that you're too dirty that Lord won't reach in and clean you up. And so you've just preached the kingdom. You, you're all, every one of us is capable of preaching the kingdom of God when you take an aspect of the ruler of the kingdom and you declare it with, with the revelation that this is what happened to me. With that, with that passion and that desire. You can't have that when you're talking about things that you're clueless to. So don't talk about those. So listen, listen. Remember when the Pharisees kept asking the, the blind guy, uh, you know, who healed you? I told you who healed you. Who healed you? I told you who healed I, Who healed you? Listen, all I know is that I was blind and now I can see. See, he didn't go into deep theology. He just says, listen, this is what I know. Jesus touched my life. He gave me the ability to forgive somebody that really hurt me. And I know that he'll forgive you too. And I know that he'll help you to forgive the person that hurt. See, that's the kingdom of God. It's that simple. There's no, like I said, every single one of you are resourced and capable of preaching the kingdom. And it doesn't take this deep theology to change someone's life. It takes a passion in believing what you're preaching. The second part of that verse, uh, the pressing... For the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Pressing is the forceful and eagerly wanting in. Forcefully and eagerly. Like I'm not, gonna, I'm not satisfied with not being part of it. I'm not satisfied with not participating. I, I want to participate. I want to press in. And the pressing part is huge. It's huge for us because... Uh, that's what is really going to open the door into these areas where you can actually preach the kingdom of God. Are you pressing into it? And when I'm saying pressing, I'm actually talking about pressing it, you know, for your own individually. You're pressing into it. See, he said everyone is pressing into it. Everyone individually is pressing in. And so uh, the press may look totally different from person to person. Your work schedule, your your hobbies, your habit, your family, your circumstances, all of this is going to look different. Are you pressing in? And you can look at your own life. I can look at myself and say, you know what? This week I didn't press in that much. Oh, yeah, but you're paid to, Lance. You have a 40-hour work week you can press in. Yeah, I know. 
But it looks, it'll look different for me than it does for you. And it'll, from you to you to you, it's going to look a little different. And so you can gauge your own heart and say, you know what, God, I'm not pressing in. Or you can say, you know what, I'm hungry. I'm pressing in. I'm pressing in this week. And, and so we look at ourselves and say that. Uh, the things that, when you eliminate these two aspects of preaching the kingdom or pressing into it, the kingdom of God is greatly stifled. And you can say, well, you know, Lance, really, how, how do I stifle the kingdom of God? We all know people have been standing on their soapboxes and preaching it for decades that the end is coming, right? And we'll be judged. That's truth. I'm not making fun of that. But we all know that there'll be a time and a place when the kingdom of God completely overwhelms the kingdom of Satan. Because it's not an equal kingdoms that are battling back and forth. That's not the case. Right now, by his design, the kingdom of God is not completely overwhelmed the kingdom of Satan. That will happen in the end, and all of that will be dealt with. But until then, you are handpicked and you're chosen like like a friend of mine says, special forces. You've been sent from the kingdom of God into the kingdom, kingdoms of this world, which we classified, and you're trying to save every single person possible before this overwhelming, uh, complete domination and removal of the kingdom of Satan. Because everyone that hasn't surrendered is going to be removed with that. And so, by like special forces, this is you, You've been moved in, and, and you're behind enemy lines, and you're trying to save anyone willing to change locations and change their membership card or whatever. This is you. And so to say, yeah, can, do I stifle the kingdom of God? Well, guess what? If you were behind enemy lines, and you, and you weren't trying to reach anyone, well... But that's not you and that's not me because we can preach the things that's impacted our life to preach the kingdom of God and we can press into the kingdom of God and say, God, I need more resources. I need another open door. I need, I need the right things to say. So we press into it. And there's four areas I want you to look uh, for all of us to look at ourselves and say, are these things happening in my life? If they're not, then I can, press, I can press a little more and operate uh, to a higher level in the kingdom of God. And really, these are the things that you're going to see active in your life. And, and I like the way that the, these are, number one, is there is a pursuit of, uh, in prayer. Um, I talk with the young adults a lot. I tell them, pray like, pray like God is right there because he is. Don't, you don't, it's not about saying these spiritual terms and talking like you've been through Bible school, that's not what prayer is. Now, now I, <laughs> Bailey is taking it to a new level because <laughs> I, I said, talk like he's right. I didn't say talk like he's one of your homies. <laughs> but apparently that's kind of where it's gone. Uh, it's, it's funny, and I think God giggles. Because we do need this, we do need this, this reality that God is there and He's with us, and it, it, you know the Bible says that we're a friend of God, and so we need to. Praying is not going through the motions. That's what the Pharisees did. Remember, Jesus even said, "Oh, you like to pray in the streets with these perfect words, so everybody can hear you," and they all, "Woo, you pray so good," but that's meaningless. What's meaningful is just opening up your heart and saying, you know what, God, I blew it today. Or maybe it's, God, you know what, this coworker of mine, I can just see they need you. They need you big time. It's just being real. Pray. I, that's how I would encourage you. I used to, I drove semi truck. And uh, while I was driving, big old steering wheel, you know, I'd be talking to God. You know, God, just make this day. I'm going to this delivery, and this guy is a grouch. 
every time. This <laughs> help this stop go quickly, you know. And I I talked with it in in much of my relationship with the Lord was developed behind the steering wheel of a semi-truck. And it can be, and that's what I mean. It'll look different for me, for you. Maybe it's, you know, while you're in the kitchen making a meal or while you're doing, whatever it is, your press is going to look different, but it still can be there. You're going to have a pursuit in prayer. That's number one. Number two is engaging the enemy. Woo-hoo. Sounds spooky. <laughs> it's not really. Satan's kingdom is destroying people's lives. Remember the descriptions that we read? It's destroying people's lives. It's not spooky for somebody with resources from the kingdom of God to move in and help restore somebody's life. That's not scary. That's not spooky. It shouldn't be. Now, the devil doesn't like to just give up. He might resist you, but remember, you're from the kingdom that has been pure for this season chosen not to just completely overwhelm him because people need a freedom of choice. But Jesus said, I saw him, see, when there was the establishment of these two kingdoms is when, when the devil resisted God in heaven and Jesus said, I saw him fall like lightning from heaven. It wasn't a battle. Are you kidding me? Uh, that's not quite what he said, but it's close. He said, I saw him fall like lightning. That's how fast, that's how fast that the kingdom of heaven overwhelms the enemy. You're resourced from the kingdom of heaven. You're resourced from the kingdom of God. Don't fear the enemy. Don't fear his resistance. Don't fear that you're going you're gonna to have a pursuit in prayer and you're going to engage the enemy. And any time that you engage something in someone's life that has been uh, that's been hard for them. It's been hurtful to them. It's been broken in their, their hearts been broken in these areas. You're engaging the fruit of this kingdom over here. That's not scary. In fact, that's pretty awesome when somebody is set free from that anger toward, you know, a, a parent or something that abused or whatever it is. When they're set free from that, that's a good feeling. Don't fear that. Number three, expect the miraculous because you actually are resourced from the kingdom of God and the kind of his realm of operation is the miraculous. Don't, uh, why should it be a surprise to us when we pray for somebody that God actually does something in their life? That should be our expectation. I remember uh, one of the first times that, uh, I was sitting in a Bible study, and, and the guy teaching it said, uh, you know, does anyone here have someone that they really care about that's not saved? Well, that's kind of a, yeah, hello. We all do, probably. But I, I was like, yeah, me. He said, what's the person's name? I told him the name. Hadn't talked to the guy in a long, long time. Last I'd heard, he's living in the clubs and living this terrible life and whatever. Uh, you know, bounce, bouncing around girls and drinking and just stuff. And so we're like, well, let's pray for him. So we prayed three days. It was the third day after that. The guy calls me out of the blue. So Lance, my life is a wreck. I need God. I need Jesus and I don't know what to do. Can you help me? I hadn't talked to him in months and months and months. And it, and it you know, and it shocks me. Oh my goodness, what just happened? Well, God answered your prayer. <laughs> You're resourced from the kingdom of God. Expect the miraculous in your life. We, we beat ourselves down to where we don't, we don't think that God's actually going to do something. God, we, we expect, uh, God, I, don't, I just don't think he's going to actually save my kid or my coworker. No, he is. Pursue it in prayer. Pursue it. Expect the miraculous. Engage the enemy in their life. Engage that area in their life where they need to be set free. The last thing where we'll see, we'll see this kingdom represented in our life 
Uh, number four is a burning desire to share the gospel because, and I want to remind you, one of the aspects of the ministry of Jesus was to baptize and infill people with the Holy Spirit and fire. It's not one or the other. It's the Holy Spirit and fire because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life should produce a consuming fire. In fact, that's one of the descriptions of God. He is a consuming fire. That's actually in the Bible. We should have this burning desire to share not the gospel in its full, you know, we're not going to understand it all. i I don't understand it all. You don't understand it all. But there should be a desire to share when we see somebody uh, that is experiencing something that we experienced. If the kingdom of God is alive in you, there'll be a desire in you to say, you know what? I may not know a lot, but I was blind and now I see and I can at least say that. I was lost and now I'm found. I can say that. There should be a desire in us, a burning desire, that uh, a passion to share what's been re given to us and share that with somebody else. And these things, uh, without these things, the kingdom of God becomes uh, stifled. I don't know if stifled would be the right word, but uh, it will lack the potential penetration into the life into our realm of influence, our sphere of influence, it will lack its potential if we don't allow these things to start happening in our life. Pursue in prayer, engage the enemy, expect the miraculous, desire to share the gospel. This, these are things of the kingdom of God that you are capable, you've been hand-picked, literally hand-picked. All that he has, right, he's called He's predestined and he's called and he's chosen and he's glorified, he's justified. You, you are handpicked to represent as an ambassador of Christ of the kingdom of God. He chose you. That just got real loud. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's something that we need to get a hold of today. You are handpicked for this time, this season. It's not an accident. You're not here to just like live your life in this bubble of, yeah, I believe, I believe in Jesus. He's, he's my savior. I'm gonna, when I die, I go to heaven. That's awesome. That's one third. That's one third of, of the, the reality of Jesus on the earth. That's one third of your walk in Christianity. You're handpicked to accomplish great things, miraculous things. Expect the miraculous. Expect God to change people's lives through you. Expect the, that attribute that you pick that impacted you. Expect that to impact someone else. This is your potential. This is your capacity. It's, I think we've almost been tricked into thinking that this whole kingdom of God aspect is like, it's only for the few and the chosen, those that go through Bible school, those who are ordained or something, those who, you know, spend 25 years in Bible studies and dissecting the word and learning all the Greek and Hebrew. No. Kingdom of God is for you. Kingdom of God is for you to share and take and change people's lives. So I want to pray over you because I think that if you're looking at yourself, you're looking at your life and you're saying, you know what? I lack that fire or I lack that uh, expectation for the miraculous. All right. I lack that pursuit in prayer. If there's, some, if there's one of these things that you're saying, you know what? I lack that. I want to pray for you because there's no sense in leaving feeling like you're not resourced, that God is not with you, that you're not an ambassador somehow. You're, you're ambassadors for Christ and you're ambassadors for this kingdom as special forces into the area of Satan's rule in his kingdom. 
See, the Bible said that the gates, those gates there, they're not going to, they're not going to hinder you. They're not going to stop you. The gates of hell will not prevail. This is, this is your potential. So Father, I just pray in Jesus name, God, because this is a people, Lord, that you have handpicked and you have chosen to take the gospel of the kingdom of God into the world around them. Maybe that world around them is one coworker or one family member. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's to a city. God, you, you'll, set, you'll set those boundaries, those numbers, that area of influence. You'll do that. But God, I pray in Jesus' name that we wouldn't be robbed into thinking that somehow our impact, that, that we're not called to impact, that we're part of this kingdom, but yet we haven't been resourced. God, I, I refresh my own mind and my own heart by just reading the descriptions about you. That's refreshing to me. Helps me to refocus, say, you know what? This is the God I serve. He is merciful and gracious and loving and kind. He's just. But he's a savior. Never be a savior without being just. He's a redeemer. He's a friend. God, this is, this is my ruler. So, Father, I pray in Jesus' name that every single person here, Lord, that you would, like, like a, a scalpel, you'd begin to cut away those things that people have said or taught that have caused them to think that they're not fit for sharing the gospel that they're not fit to be an ambassador for the kingdom of God. Lord, I pray that you'd be doing away with those things in Jesus' name and that we would find ourselves expecting you to move in our life, expecting the miraculous, expecting, God, a relationship through prayer, expecting, God, that when I share the gospel that lives will be changed. Now, it might not happen right in front of my eyes, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that we, would, that we would see our potential because we see our ruler. We see our savior. We see our friend. We see this kingdom and we know, well, this is a good kingdom. The rule and reign of our father in heaven. That's my ruler. And so, Father, I pray, God, that you would resource every person here Lord, I pray that they would see, they would understand their resource. They wouldn't live life trying to make the kingdom of Satan a better place, but their life would be to infiltrate and to draw anyone out that would be willing. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name for this. Father, I praise you. Amen. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope this was an encouragement for you. And we will see you next week.